Thank you for joining us today. Just a few quick, uh, very, uh, excuse me, very quick reminders before we get started. All attendees are muted. And if you're using the event app, we encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and be sure to complete the session survey at the end. This session is TLP white and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the conference app. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to your session moderator, Natsuko Inui, and I will throw it over to her. Thanks so much. Take it away, Natsuko. Thank you, Kristen. So hello, everybody. This is Natsuko Inui, and I will be moderating the session today. Uh, today, you are attending the session Scaling Vulnerability Coordination. Um, just one item before we get started. So we ask that you submit your questions um, for Q&A through the Q&A section uh, in the Zoom screen uh, you have. Um, the questions will be queued in the order they are received. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So I will start by introducing your speaker today for this uh, session. So Francis Perron is um, at Google in incident response. Um, he is actually from Canada, but is currently now in Switzerland. Uh, he has joined Google 2017 and started out in site reliability engineering, site reliability engineering uh, and has since moved on through several different roles, including um, responding to availability incidents um, across the Google production environment and to full-time digital forensics and incident response role, uh, which, which is where he has been since 2017. So with that, I think I will turn the tables over to you, Francis. Take it away. Thank you, Natsuko. Hi, everybody. Um, so thank you for joining me. And uh, yeah, let's see, let's see how this virtual conferencing uh, pans out. So it's going to be my first, first presentation entirely online. So let's see how we fare. Um, so today I wanted to present a case study, essentially, uh, the approach that Google took to try and scale uh, the classic PCERT structure. So this is again a case study because um, this is going to be we're going to go look at the proposal that we made and how it worked out because at earlier in 2020 this is when we started uh, implementing and looking into this. So before getting started, um, a little little a um, little bit about nomenclature here. So the word PCERT, so product security. Um, the way that I'm going to be referring and using it and the material that I have is really around. Uh, these vulnerabilities that are kind of time sensitive, very complicated, very complex, cross products, cross PAs inside, inside companies, the impact is spread. And there's also a need for coordinated vulnerability disclosure. So uh, the single product impact vulnerabilities are not really in scope for this case study as well as uh, what we worked on. Uh, this is already being dealt with for us internally. With, we have a fairly large security team at this point, which uh, satisfied pretty much all of these little like um, one product vulnerability issues when there's a new CVs uh, like coming out in the public and so on. We have automation that takes care of that in general, but the bigger problem arises when we have coordination needs across either internally or external aspects of it. And that coordination actually, so one thing that we have internally at Google is uh, this protocol that we've, it's not invented at all. It's just that we've, we've reused something called ICS and we've adapted it to our needs internally. And we call it incident management at Google. Now this has been discussed and presented in other material. Namely, we have a book by the SRE organization that goes into very much a lot of details. And I won't, uh, I, I just wanna brush up on it because it's important for the proposal. Um, so the core and this structure, this response protocol allows us to actually use uh, the scaling methods that we have here. Uh, one thing, so this, the protocol itself has at the core, the incident coordinator. So incidents and vulnerabilities are very similar to one another, uh, and we'll get to that. But for incidents, this, uh, this protocol is shared across engineering. So the incident coordinator is a role that basically takes care of the incident. They are responsible to make sure that the incident is going smoothly. We have enough people. We don't have too many people. And it's also the role of the decision maker during the incident. Typically, especially for availability issues, uh, you get time pressure around decision making. 
the incident coordinator takes that role. Now, under that role, under that person, we typically have sub roles or leads as we refer to them, and the OL, the ops lead. So operations lead tends to be the person who fixes the issue or is responsible to do so. And that means that they have to, and they're responsible to build a team that will fix the issue. You see the little periodic uh, symbol on top of it here. This reference is, uh, this is just to illustrate the fact that you can have multiple operations lead in a bigger incident, for example. If you need to split the incident in sub aspects or sub tactical responses, this is where this would be multiplied. Another lead role that is fairly critical to most incidents is communications. So a communications lead would be responsible for communications inside and outside of incidents, uh, sometimes split as well for press or internal comms and so on. And a little, little star here, because this structure is very simple and very lightweight, we tend to, like it allows for scaling up and down in the number of leads as well as the size of the response. If, for example, an incident requires uh, a legal person to give advice, well, then we would elect a legal lead. Uh, so that's what I mean here by like, depending on the incident, you will scale this up as needed. This is for incident, but turns out vulnerability management is very close to this. Um, you know, it's a very simple, a very, well, it's a big difference, but as far as coordinating, uh, it's pretty much the same. So what we are doing is that we're reusing entirely the whole protocol. We're just calling it vulnerability coordinator instead of incident coordinator uh, to make everyone happier about it. And on, at the level of the operations lead, for vulnerabilities, this tends to be per product because you need a certain level of expertise and knowledge that one person does not typically have or can gather for like Android and Chrome, for example. Those are two different beasts. And when an incident or when a vulnerability touches on both or impacts both, we would have a, like an ops lead for Chrome and an ops lead for Android. But the rest of the structure is actually the same. And that's kind of the beauty of it because the, the whole of the engineering corpus is trained in that protocol, meaning that when we have an incident that impacts them and you know uh, an incident commander or coordinator reaches out, they know the protocol, they know what to expect. And banking on this, we can actually start scaling things. And by scaling here, I mean that how do we, with a small group of people, respond to pretty much all vulnerability, uh, like uh, all coordinated vulnerabilities as we see them fly by. Now, according to the, uh, like not official, but the definitions that we see in the wild, uh, namely one of them is promoted by the, the PCERT, the CERT, PCERT SIG at first. Uh, there was a document about it a couple of years ago. It basically discusses centralized versus distributed and includes an in-between called hybrid PCERT. Uh, structures. Uh, the hybrid is kind of like in between, but the two extremes are centralized versus distributed in that case. Now, for a centralized PCERT, uh, this is actually not, so we looked into it and for us at Google, it does not make much sense. Uh, the problem that we have is that we have too many products and, you know, we're not unique. I mean, a lot of companies share that problem and it's, it becomes very hard to have a central team that basically has all of the expert knowledge to do security fixes, security rollouts, uh, and implement these policies and so on to so many other PAs and products. So looking at this from like, as an implementation problem, uh, this isn't something we, we can look into. Now on the other end of the spectrum, the distributed model, uh, what we have here is that we have a smaller team that is, part, that is the PCERT core team. And next to that, we basically interact and leverage experts across the various products. Now, this is actually getting interesting, but it means that we need security experts or security savvy folks in most of these products and PAs. That kind of happens at Google for us. So we're actually in a good place to look into this. And the small core team is actually really exciting as well because we can get started, we can pilot ideas much faster than if we need to hire a full team of staff, uh, expert security engineers, for example. So 
banking on that again, we picked the distributed approach and kind of pushed it even further a little bit. And this is where our implementation comes in. So meet Vert. Uh, Vert is our proposal and solution. So earlier in 2020, we designed and started implementing this. So the rotation itself is like, so this is a vulnerability incident response team. Now the name is a kind of a mouthful and you know we put vulnerability and incident response team in one word, internal nomenclature rules and so on. Essentially, it's a rotation that is staffed by volunteers. And here, these volunteers actually come from everywhere. And volunteering for us internally at Google means using this 20% project that we get. So as part of our contract, we're basically allowed to use 20% of our time to do personal projects, personal growth projects. Uh, that could also include working in other teams just to help out to discover things. So using that, we're actually using people's 20% projects to contribute to an incident response team that focuses on vulnerabilities. With that, it allows us to also have a very small core team that is associated with the rotation. And this is, again, using the distributed model approach. This uh, We've kind of limited this to just a, a little minimum requirement set, essentially cross site, cross time zone, and cross teams. Uh, just to allow the core team folks to go on vacation, to take time off, to be sick, as simple as that sounds. And it's even more relevant nowadays, I find. Um, so we have a small team, core team of experts that have been doing vulnerability coordination for a while and are able to actually help and mentor and assist and a, rotation, and a couple of volunteers. So what does it mean to volunteer and why would people actually volunteer for this? So we found out that uh, we did a couple of recruitment campaigns uh, through email internally. And uh, Daniel, I'm going to get to your question in a second. Um, and what we found is that the aspect of career growth was really interesting for folks because it's a very different problem set to most products, most software development uh, problems that they have to deal with. And at the same time, security is actually really interesting nowadays. So we see it more and more in the news and folks actually, there is kind of an uptick in that trend and we're using this as well. Turns out folks love it. And at the same time, this, the third bullet point here is really because since we're dealing with volunteers, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to guarantee that they will be around. And it's essentially, it's not part of their core job. Uh, so the way we work with this is that we get kind of commitments, not written down contracts per se, but really a year long commitment that you will be a part of this rotation and you're expected to give this many hours. And we get agreement uh, through the management chain of that person as well, which helps solidify all of that. And so far we've had really good success here. Now, Daniel's question was, uh, how do these volunteers get trained in the area they wish to support? Uh, I'll get to that in the last section of the caveats, uh, but essentially training, uh, we don't have specialties. Uh, and that means that vulnerabilities are, the products impacted is agnostic to the situation because of the protocol that we use, the incident management protocol. It doesn't matter what incident or vulnerability is being taken care of. And that's, that's actually the beauty of it. So, does it work? Um, I think it does. And well, many of us actually do agree here and it's quite good because we've had, uh, we've had, so we started the program in early 2020, recruitment started in February, just about, and we started training folks to uh, like coordination, how to deal with vulnerabilities and vulnerabilities in general, what security topics uh, mean and what, what is it to have an embargo and how to respect it and so on. So we've built training and we've kind of gotten that down in the first quarter and a half of the year, I would say. And at that point in the second quarter, just about June or just about June, we started looping in rotators and volunteers into coordination of these vulnerabilities. And uh, one of them that actually was a nice success story is uh, just about in July, there was a disclosure and this vulnerability called boot hole 
uh, which uh, I don't know if folks remember, but quickly it was uh, there was a problem with secure boot and grub and the way that uh, shims could be ex exploited to you know work on the whitelist and get more binaries trusted, which was an issue. Uh, so it turns out corporate environments across various industries were impacted. Ours was as well a little bit. So we needed to coordinate across acquisitions, across corporate, and some products who may be impacted. Uh, for example, like our Google Cloud stuff, uh, do we need to loop in coordination as well in there? So this vulnerability came in through an usual pipeline, uh, and we decided, OK, let's do a coordinated response internally, at least to this. What ended up happening is a classic. So we ramped up a response with a vulnerability coordinator at the top and then an operations lead who was basically our technical person uh, working to help us make good judgment call. We also had someone taking care of scoping and managing the impact on the mergers and acquisitions. We also had someone who was basically owning the communications, uh, preparing the press statements and all that just reactively and so. And we also had operations lead assigned to each of the products impacted we knew about. And externally to that, there was also external communication and sorry, coordination. So for example, working with the, the researchers and stuff like that, the classic CVD issue and aspects. And when we started this response, we looped in two volunteers from VERT right off the bat who would sit next to the coordinator and they would basically get as much context as we as possible. Uh, invited to every sync meetings and decision making and shared with documents and all that. And basically at the end of every meeting that we had, um, I was a coordinator for that one. And I would just sit down five minutes past the meeting and just, okay, like let's debrief a little bit. Do you have any questions? And let's address those comments and what went on and so on. Just a quick five minute recap at the end of every meeting turned out to be really impactful here. Towards the end, well, towards the end, as in close to the disclosure in July, uh, I needed to sadly go on vacation in a very, uh, you know, bad timing, I guess you want to call it. But this was also a really good opportunity for us. And what we did is we asked the volunteers to take over because they were trained. We trusted they would make a good judgment and they did. So we basically inserted two volunteers straight up, took over the coordination role and another volunteer who was uh, also shadowing during the whole time took over communications leads. And that worked out real well. And then we kept someone senior on the uh, CVD aspects of it, essentially, to maintain the relationship with the researchers. Uh, we did not actually do a change at that level, but that was also a minimal amount of communication that needed to happen any further. So for us, this was a success story. And it gave us hope that it would, would actually be able to make something out of this. Um, since then, so that was July. Now this is a few months later. We've had other instances of these, uh, like very similar scenarios. Uh, sadly, a lot of these disclosures are not possible for me to discuss here. But and but there's still like there's most of our rotation has been doing these shadow experiences at this point to the point where right now we have ongoing vulnerabilities that from time zero have gotten the rotators to basically coordinate. And uh, this is actually a very positive outcome for us. Now, um, of course, since this is a young program, we're kind of still in the early stages of it uh, from a program management perspective. So we're still developing the whole structure of it. And that means how do we streamline the training? How do we improve on it? And we're doing that right now. We're kind of like working with the rotation people to just say like what worked and what didn't, how, to, how do we together build a better program here? Uh, how do we ensure mentoring is consistent and high quality and involves and interests people? Working on these two aspects simultaneously. And um, I'm gonna get to that question in a second and maturing this further. So basically what we mean here is how do we make this self-sustained sustained of sorts? As in what happens with the recruits from last year? Do we ask them to give their spot to somebody else or do we take these folks and make them, you know, train them into even more senior contributors, which would actually 
help out in the longer term. But we we're working on these on these ideas, and we're going to be exploring this in the early 2021 uh, stage. There's a question. Do these rotators also coordinate with external teams in case of cross-company coordination? Uh, in some cases, yes, we've had uh, we've had successes where basically when we engage with the external companies or researchers, we basically go in pairs, and, uh, and the main coordinator always stays basically on the line or as a backup and drives the communication at first, but always loops in the rotator, who then starts taking more and more space into that. Uh, so um, yeah, we do have rotators basically managing external or uh, intercompany coordination in some cases. Now, there's the other aspect of it, which is um, how do we deal with very urgent vulnerabilities? And that's actually a legit question. Given this is a rotation of volunteers, we don't really we can't expect folks to do 24-7 contributions to a response. Uh, Google tends to have 24-7, like just we call it follow the sun uh, response or coverage in general. So if we have an issue, oh, if we have an issue and it requires hourly updates and so on, we call these P0s. Uh, so right now, the program is not able and staffed to handle that kind of pressure or demand. So we are still working with our incident management team who has been historically dealing with these things. Uh, so we're working with them still. The goal here is really so that the program gets more mature, develops itself into something more structured, and we can remove some of these P0 vulnerabilities from the incidents, uh, the incident management team. But that's not gonna happen right now. We're looking at how we can design this and work with this in the future. That's actually all the material I had. Uh, wanted to thank you all to attend, like for attending this. Um, little note here, some information, like uh, some contact information for me. So if you have questions that you prefer to send over emails or discuss privately, just feel free to reach out by email. I do have a Twitter account, but don't expect me to be too much on this. Um, I, it's created, it works. And uh, the last point here is that we are planning to actually try and write up and publish a white paper on this as well. So hopefully we'll be able to actually go into further details about this and uh, we will also have like more experience and more, uh, more history so that we can actually expand on some of these things that worked and didn't. So hopefully pandemic willing as written here. So that's all I had. Uh, Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions from here on. Thank you, Francis. So uh, you addressed both questions, I think, that are in the um, uh, Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, what I was wondering, so if somebody listening wanted to become involved um, and get the um, training and join, uh, to, do they just contact you, or is there something they go through? Oh, you mean get access to the actual training material we did? Yes. Ah, um, at the moment, it's very internal uh, because we do discuss uh, vulnerabilities that we've had to deal with and what kind of impact and response we've made for them. Uh, so this, the material as, as is is definitely not publishable externally. But if you're curious, I'm happy to uh, basically go over the steps. Like this is pretty generic in the sense of CVD training. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you've had to deal with coordination with cross-company stuff, uh, or if you basic. haven't, actually, there's some good resources already on the PCERT SIG mm -hmm. at first. Yeah. Thank you. So another question has popped up. So do you plan to publish security advisories in machine possible format like CSAF? So that's kind of a... I think that's out of topic a little bit. Uh, I do not know what the plans are for that. Like, as far as we're concerned, like uh, these, this team or this program really focuses on coordination of vulnerability disclosures uh, and also like the internal responses we may need and stuff like that. It doesn't really scope out the security advisory aspects of impacted products and how we communicate because the like our, the, the Google Cloud products actually 
communicate outside through security advisories. So sometimes these actually make it out. Uh, I think those actually follow a very handwritten format at the moment. Uh, if you're asking for like something that has enough structure to be processed, uh, CVEs and CPEs are pretty much what I can think of at the moment that we have like that is very public. Chrome also has advisories, Project Zero also, but those, are, those tend to be manually generated. Thomas, I'm sorry, I hope that answers a little bit of your question. Thank you. So if there aren't any more questions at the moment, if you had anything else that you wanted to say, but actually cut out of your presentation because of time restrictions, I think um, you have a couple of minutes to go through that or we can maybe end early. Oh, one more question. What nice. have you learned so far? What have we learned so far is that um, this idea of using volunteers to uh, handle like critical vulnerabilities was scaring a lot of people, especially like senior managers. And uh, so we went about it very cautiously. Uh, at the end of the day though, like six months in, we were showing really positive results, which even surprised us. So I think what we learned is that it's surprisingly feasible to actually train folks in a very generic like coordination aspect of things. Uh, like we're, we're really happy with the results that we've had and we really wanna see how far we can push this even further. And that's why we're actually having folks lead full vulnerability responses up to uh, recently. And again, super positive. I couldn't have sort of better results like inside a year. So uh, yeah, so. That's excellent. Thanks for asking Lisa. Okay, so there's actually one more question. So um, uh, I joined late and may have missed it, but what teams are you inviting to participate as volunteers? How do you know they can do the work? It's a good question. So when we first did the first recruitment uh, of emails, essentially, uh, I targeted very generic roles. Essentially, the for the first wave, we looked at candidates who were in engineering and in roles of either program management, technical program management, like all of these together, as well as engineering, like software engineering, uh, site reliability engineering. We also have um, uh, folks that are a bit more junior on the tech ladders. And we've actually included some of those folks as well, just to see, and we have a lot of variety at this point. We don't actually have anybody from security on that rotation. So that has also been like something folks weren't sure about, but turns out, if you have passionate people, it actually works well. Yes. Um, actually, another question. So I have read that you published the bleeding tooth vulnerability. I was just wondering why it is not in MVD yet. Um, it's only in reserve status. Uh, is that usual when you publish such critical vulnerabilities? So this uh, question sadly shouldn't be addressed to me. So Intel agreed and owns the CVE publications for these. Uh, we, uh, I can ping them and see if they're ready to issue, but generally speaking, I think that they have a regular cadence of issuing. So it might be in the next revision or the next push that they have. I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for you on that one. Okay, with that, I think we are pretty much just at um, our time. So thank you, Francis, and thank you for all of the lively questions. Um, lots of comments saying that this is a very um, good idea, interesting, um, initiative for Google cool. to do. And uh, I find um, many people are very interested in what Google is doing. So thank you again, Francis, for this okay. very interesting, wonderful presentation. And thank you for the audience for participating in this session today. Um, so the next session will begin in just about five minutes. So please all jump on to your next scheduled session. Um, I'll have a nice day, have a nice conference and see you all soon. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks again, everyone. Be safe. Thank you. Ciao.